All right. So I'm very excited. This is one of my favorites. I guess I say that every week. It's one of my favorite parts of the class, but I do say that every week. Um, because the uh, use of theory in empirical research um, is one of the great differentiating factors between really crappy, mediocre papers and really nice papers. So hopefully I get to instill some of that excitement in you through this lecture and series of readings. I see, I see great excitement. <laughs> must be. Did you know January is the most depressing month? I think February is. Oh. Is in my opinion. So it's downtown from here is what you're saying? <laughs> maybe, maybe different here, but like in Michigan, it's still cold in February. Oh, here it's cold until yes. like May. Well, it feels kind of balmy right now. Yeah. So today, yeah, I'm up here. Yeah. Um, look at the sunrise this morning, though. This is like taken every single morning. Um, this is like updated every single morning in the picture. Sometimes the photographer goes out at night. Um, but you know, it's often sunrise, sometimes it's sunset, sometimes it's just random things. Um, just you know, by coincidence, I guess the last well, like every day, right? Yeah, sometimes multiple times a day. Yeah, it's unusual that he doesn't post every day. But this was the post this morning. Look at that. Look at that sunrise in Pittsburgh. Hello, welcome back. But, okay, so what I'd like to do today is um, start by discussing the two readings. And thank you so much for volunteering to present. Um, and we're going to reflect on those a bit and reflect more broadly, kind of zoom out a bit more on theory, what we mean when we say theory uh, when it comes to empirical research and how people uh, tend to use theory in empirical research. Um, and if we have time, we're going to discuss the other two things that I asked you to think about um, answers to several questions, um, the, uh, breaking APIs papers. And if not, we're going to talk about them on Thursday. Um, and we're sort of transitioning from this into lit reviews. We're going to talk about how to do lit reviews on Thursday. Um, you know, how to write a good one, how to identify a good knowledge gap. Very much related to formulating research questions from last time. You review the literature to identify gaps in knowledge and you formulate new research questions to fill those gaps. Uh, and this is the starting point for hopefully, you know, your journey and your research projects, which you will start thinking about shortly, I'm sure. Um, I have an exciting lit review assignment coming up where I'll ask you to do a brief lit review on uh, biases in faculty course evaluations. So the scores that students give to faculty for the courses they taught. Like you will be you know, getting a grade at the end. Uh, and there's all kinds of interesting uh, biases that creep up in these. For example, I don't know, lots of literature and evidence by now that women tend to get lower scores than men when they're course instructors and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to review some of this literature and write down a short lit review for next week. And then I promised you that uh, we can maybe do this hands-on later on. I'm trying to scrape now this cool data set that CMU has of all of the FCs, of all of the CMU instructors, of all of the CMU courses. So then we can test out some of these hypotheses later on in the semester uh, ourselves. That'll be very exciting. So, let's see if this works out. That's my grand plan. Any thoughts or questions? Concerns? I see so much joy. People love being here. I see. Okay, um, let's do the readings. Um, maybe, oh, but, oh, one more thing. So, the, I don't know if I mentioned this before, you know, what, the, what, what this class is and isn't about. It's about, you know, reviewing papers, it's about science, it's about communication, it's about a number of things. I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's also about what I hope uh, will be great writing. Um, so, you know, the readings that we pick for discussion in class um, are often very well written papers. Um, I happen to really like both of these. 
one of them is a little easier to read than the other. The uh, the Kai paper is a little easier to read, um, but they're both very well written. In fact, I have um, the way the way I usually do this. You, you know, if you look at, I'll share this with you later. You know, I when I read these, I highlight particularly well written sentences and paragraphs and things like this as I read papers. And then I shamelessly steal all of these when it comes time to write my own. Uh, so hopefully, you know, over the course of the semester, by reading lots and lots of papers that are hopefully mostly or not always well written, you get to learn to do some of this too. You get to learn to steal, you know, great phrases and whatnot to add to your own writing later on. So I, I always do this. Um, sorry, I thought we were reading to where uh, uh, Bogart at all um, out of Rick and API and Raymockers. We're going to do this separately. Uh, the readings oh. were um, the uh, these two. Oh. Um, I also misunderstood. Did you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everybody misunderstood that? Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> I was also under the impression that I was the only one reading that paper. So, if that helped. Yeah, I thought others would maybe oh. give these two. So the, uh, the email I sent back Canvas didn't make sense. I thought I would just present them and everyone would, everyone would understand it. <laughs> <laughs> you are very good at presenting, I'm sure. So that will probably be true regardless. But uh, hold on, let me figure out what I did wrong. So I sent, after class on Thursday, I sent you all an email through Canvas with the plan and instructions for how to read and to sign up for presenting these papers and whatnot. Did you get that? I, I got that. Well, I was particularly confused was coming from class Thursday. I thought there were two papers to read, not these two. On Canvas, I saw your message and I ended up reading like four or five times. And by like the fifth time, I was like, oh, there's four papers to read. Okay, so I did get it, but after like five reads. Okay, so I apologize for the confusion and how I worded this. On my side, I remember the two papers that you mentioned in the class. And since it said two papers in the second point and not explicitly the names, I did not press the link. And so I thought they were the same papers. Ah, uh, yeah. same. <laughs> okay, so see, that was an example of bad writing. Okay, on my part. So we're gonna learn to do better. I'm sorry about the confusion. We will talk about all four papers, just not all four at the same time. Uh, I want to start with these because they talk about theory very explicitly. Um, the other ones, we can reflect on the use of theory. I was going to do that at the end of class, depending on how we're doing with time. So we're going to come back to Raymarkers and Bogart et al. later. Uh, but I want to start with these two. And you know, it's totally fine if you haven't all read them, obviously, uh, to survive this episode. Move on. Um, and I will promise to be clear about instructions next time. So, no biggie. Uh, but anyway, so these are um, two papers that both use theory in slightly different ways. And I wanted us to reflect on how they do that. Um, so, we'll listen to some presentations about what the papers are. And Kai and Hemant volunteered very kindly to present this today. I'm going to listen to those have some discussion. Um, if you haven't read these yet, you know, just go back and, and read them afterwards, especially, you know, with the discussion we're having in class in mind, you can focus on, on the relevant parts. That's fine. And yeah, again, sorry about the uh, um, misworded email. Uh, steering you in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, I Let's start with impulse buying. Which one of you was it by? Okay. I'll just start talking. Um, so this one was, in terms of how theory was used in this paper, there were a lot of different um, avenues that they that they came up with their theories or what they got them from. The premise of the paper basically is that uh, like there had been some research on impulse buying. Um, mainly definitional, like classifying it, um, and then some more recent research uh, saying that it was like perhaps an individual trait, like some people are more likely to 
um, by impulsively than others. Um, but the the conflicting idea is that like impulse buying is like a non-normative behavior and like furthermore like judged to be like immature or wrong, but a lot of people engage in it. Um, and in some study that they cite, like 41% of people were like pleased or uh, satisfied, felt they made the right decision with their impulse um, buying. And so um, the research question basically was, uh, although like impulse buying is uh, like viewed socially negatively, um, like how do people like rationalize uh, impulse buying? What are their motivations for impulse buying? Mm -hmm. um, and so because this is such an exploratory and descriptive question, uh, they started with a qualitative analysis to generate some uh, hypotheses for like what these motivations might be. Um, so they say they use grounded theory, which I understand to be kind of a loaded term, but I'll get to that later, uh, with uh, semi-structured interviews, about 60 of them for like 20 minutes each. The semi-structure means that like they had a general guide for what questions they would be asking, but they might delve into one topic more or not, depending on like what the participants had to say. Um, and they also used deception in this uh, study because um, since it's a socially stigmatized behavior, asking directly about it will um, cause people to wrongly report more often. Um, and uh, Given the definition um, of impulse buying, I wasn't sure uh, like whether some of the quotes that were provided were direct examples of impulse buying, because the downside of deception is that you can't ask them directly whether or not it was an example of impulse buying. But they had some literature that supported the uh, idea that um, people who were uh, like purchasing uh, to satisfy like hedonic needs or like fun um, and what was it like money <laughs> uh, were um, more likely to be impulse buying. Um, and so basically um, going back to how I said there were like a lot of different areas the theories came from, um, they used data from these interviews and um, uh, to generate three hypotheses, and they conjectured three more from existing literature for like reasons that um, people might be impulse impulsively buying. Um, and the first three um, from their interviews, uh, the the first one came about from topics that they were specifically looking for in the text based on a paper that they had, had read about those hedonic desires. And the other two hypotheses um, that they made uh, came up naturally via the, um, via the data. And the most prevalent one was, I think, more self-actualization um, or social needs. Um, basically, people would buy a dress because they thought that, like, if their viewed is more beautiful, their social standing will improve, and, like, those weren't, um, like, things that they were making planned buying decisions for. Mm -hmm. They would maybe go with a loose idea that they wanted a dress for such and such event, and then see it and be like, that's perfect, that's the one, like, getting this one. Couldn't believe it, something like that. Um, and then the background literature, I think they used, like, human information processing theory um, to sort of like uh, conjecture that if people are, if it requires a lot of cognitive effort to make a decision, people may be more likely to impulsively buy something because that like, um, at, at a certain point, it's like a, um, like costs and benefits trade off. Like you don't want to spend too much time on, on uh, something before you make the decision. Um, there was also 
similarly, um, uh, another hypothesis that was about like whether the decision effort uh, like vary, varies with the impulsive buying trait. Um, so yeah, they originally used previous theory as sort of a top-down view at their data. Then they, via some kind of grounded theory approach, um, found created bottom-up theories like from the same data. And then they conjectured like another three uh, to take them into like the quantitative phase where they more like um, where they like validated or tested these theories using a questionnaire or survey. Um, Can I pause for a second? Yes. It's like, this is a lot of stuff. This is one, one paper. It's a lot, of, it's a lot going on. Right, so I, I want you to sort of recognize how much is going on here. Like A, they read the literature, prior work that came before them, uh, and figured out what we don't know about why people impulse buy, or kind of what we know, like why why people impulse buy, right? All of this, all these things. B, they, in addition to all of this, ran or did an exploratory study with I don't know sixty people or something. Mm -hmm. They ran sixty interviews. That's a lot of interviews. Trying to figure out why this sample of their participants also bought stuff impulsively. Okay. And they brought all of these things together the knowledge from the literature and the findings from the interviews to generate some new hypotheses about why people buy stuff impulsively and what you know characteristics may make it more or less likely for people to buy stuff impulsively and, and whatnot. Is that true? I don't remember fully, correct me. Yeah, that's that's good for example. <laughs> and then they ran a survey with a bazillion other people. A bazillion. Um I'm not sure the number of people they like 215. Okay, 215 other people than the 60. And they found more evidence supporting or not some of these hypotheses about moderating factors and whatever else. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's this, you know, very exploratory open-ended thing, which is why do people buy stuff impossibly? By the way, the smaller side, speaking of writing, Great writing. The first sentence in the paper. What, what a simple, beautiful sentence. You know, impulse buying behavior is an enigma in the marketing world. Who uses the word enigma in a paper? Such a such a pretty word. It's just very you know. Like, wow. Well, okay. Like you got me. You know. Like well, great mystery. It seems like you know, like murder on a train or whatever. So sort of. <laughs> it's like wow. Well, okay. Like you have my attention. You know. It's like I want to read. Okay. So you know, open ended exploratory which suggests this social constructivist worldview. Like, hey, we have this enigma, we're trying to make some sense of it. You know, let's collect all the evidence we can, including this ground from the ground up, the like ground theory thing. Like we start from what these people tell us in these interviews and we try to make sense and, and so on. And then they build some theory from this. You know, why do people buy stuff impulsively online? What characteristics make it more likely or less likely and so on? What reasons might they have? What mechanisms might cause this? Uh, and then they go run a survey to collect additional evidence testing these hypotheses that they came up with. So, you know, as an aside, this is a maybe great example of a mixed methods paper. Uh, because it does these two fundamentally very different things all at the same time, um, arguably for you know good purpose. We you know we learn more from these two things together than from either one of them separate. So it's a useful combination of components to this design to this study. Okay. By the way, this is you know in, in marketing, people publish longer papers and journals. Um, they tend to take longer to write them and so on. They don't publish as many as we do in computer science. Our papers tend to be shorter, you know, we publish more frequently. So the culture is different. You know, this is sort of an example of the culture in that field. 
Um, you know, it's also a very long paper. Right? But still, you know, it's a good example of a mature, complete study with lots of moving parts. Um, and arguably, you know, more generalizable insights because of this use of theory. Okay. Now, it's not so much uh, just about the sample of 60 people they did interviews with or 200 people they uh, surveyed, but rather, you know, they have evidence for some of these things that hopefully generalize to anyone and everyone. And because they sort of think of this more uh, abstractly in terms of this higher level theory or sets of theories. Please tell us more if there's more. Um, <clears throat> the quantitative part used some more words I didn't totally understand. Um, they, uh, you. <clears throat> yeah, they, they got into the types of validity I hadn't seen before, like no mode, no mode something. Anyway, um, they created scales based on uh, previous literature for the uh, traits that they recognized were important. Um, such as like style consciousness, that's like the self-esteem thing where you like are impulsively buying because you want that dress. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had like a previously validated, like impulsive trait um scale. Um basically a variety of skills like these that they augmented with their own traits that they found were valuable. Um, the only word I recognized as far as validating the skills was uh, Chromebacks Alpha, um, which measures uh, internal consistency. Basically, like if you ask the same question in the negative or the positive, like will the respondent like respond consistently or like yeah, do your words mean the things that you that they, you think they do? Pause for a second. This is a good point. We're going to talk more about survey design and you know scale, multi-item scales and whatnot in maybe a week or so when we talk about surveys. Um, everything you said, uh, I agree with. It's a good summary. Um, I guess the reason why you do this, why would you want to ask the same question in multiple ways? It seems like it just makes the questionnaire longer and so it's more work for you, it's more work for the people that respond. The reason, as I will hopefully illustrate later, is very simple. Um, you know, the, the, any one way of asking a question could steer, could bias the response in, in some direction just because of how people interpret it. You know, look at my instructions for, you know, the readings today. But, you know, but what if I gave you the same instructions in a variety of ways, you know, variety of channels and whatnot, you know, chances that, uh, I, you know, they get misunderstood are uh, smaller. So it's the same idea here, right? You're asking the same question in a variety of ways um, to try to really get them the underlying concept, more so than to capture these superficial differences that may come up just because of how you phrase the question. So it's a, it's a good practice. The other thing I wanted to mention um, that's kind of relevant, notice how all of these things that they measured, whatever, they built uh, this questionnaire for and whatnot, all these scales, all these things they measured are not just random things. They're not, you know, let's just measure all the things we can measure. Uh, we were reading a paper with Courtney uh, earlier this morning uh, for the project she's working on, it's related work. Um, and that paper was very much, yeah, we're just, you know, we, we measured 20 different factors and looked at their correlation with this outcome that we care about. Uh, but none of the paper was, why did you measure any of these 20 factors and not 20 other factors or five other factors or what have you? Uh, and often you see in papers that people measure 20 different factors just because they can, because the data is available somewhere, but they have no reason to choose those 20. This is a counterexample. This is a very principled reason to choose the things they measure to choose. They all map very directly and clearly to this theoretical construct they're trying to capture. But they're not just 20 convenient things they happen to have data about, but they're 
uh, all fractionalizations, their measurements of, presumably measurements of these theoretical constructs they actually care to study. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, effort and whatnot, uh, pleasure and so on. Okay, so this is important, right? They don't just measure anything. They measure, you know, they measure things that capture the theoretical construct. End of pause. Um, and so once they validated their scales and cleaned the data, they did some ANOVA tests, which measure variance between like three or more groups who I do test, but for more. Um, and like the table basically shows like um, the asterisks, which are usually the things that uh, the double asterisks are usually the things that support their hypotheses are the ones that are statistically significant with their level, which is actually quite low. Um, I don't know what the standard is in this field, but uh, and uh, you basically read it like. Um, the two crossing attributes, like there's the hedon hedonistic consumption, and then like the uh, impulse buying trait, where they uh, coincide. It basically says like they're positively correlated with an effect size of that much, uh, like significantly due to the same images. Um, and they use the results from that to either uh, like fail to support or let's think magic words um, to either provide evidence for their hypotheses or like uh, not have enough evidence to support them. Um, and uh, one place uh, they replicated the uh, previous um, literature that supported like um, the desire to fulfill hedonic needs uh, coinciding with um, the impulsive buying trait, and they also found evidence for um, like desires to satisfy steam uh, poorly with impulsive buying. Mm -hmm. um, but one example where their qualitative and quantitative results kind of disagree was the um, desires to fill social needs, like the um, like going out with friends and things like that. Uh, they're, they had a lot of that in the qualitative responses, but they uh, didn't find it to be significant in the quantitative. So they said, that, like, this is worth looking to in the future. Like, maybe there was some construct validity and they measured the wrong thing or um, something else like that. Uh, pause for a second. Um, another good point. So often, a reason to do mixed methods research is to get more evidence for the same thing through a different method. So let's say they had some uh, hypothesis that came out of the interviews. So that's sort of subjective interpretation, small sample, whatnot. Um, you know, wouldn't it be stronger of a conclusion to the study if you could also provide some maybe quantitative evidence for the same phenomenon at much larger scale? Right? You know, if you have two things different samples, different methods, and whatnot, kind of pointing in the same direction, you're more confident that the phenomenon is, you know, there, is real, it's genuine, right? Your conclusion is valid, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so now, in this case, and that happens, that is interesting, the two things happen to disagree, okay? So the qualitative analysis said something, but then the quantitative analysis did not find evidence for that something. Okay, interesting. So wh why, what, what are some reasons for this? Why can that be? Or should they always agree? We'll give Kaya a break this. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, usually I would probably answer that people might not be reliable in, in the interviews. But in this case, I think that the people might have, I mean, they were just talking about how they feel. So it kind of seems plausible. So I'm more inclined to say maybe that the quantitative methods were more likely to be measuring incorrectly somehow. 
So these are two, you know, very obvious things to to start thinking about. Like, a, you know, you can't trust the people, right? They're misremembering or whatever. Maybe you're misinterpreting what they're saying. Maybe they're misremembering what happened. You know, whatever it may be, you know, people rationalize things in all kinds of weird ways. It may not be the real reason why they do something. Uh, we're going to see more examples of this when we talk about interviewing, especially when it comes to socially undesirable behavior. Very hard to get people to be honest about what they actually do. You know, if I ask you all how many drinks you have on a Friday night or what other substances you use and or, or not. You know, chances are you don't want to, you know, tell some stranger uh, all of that, right? Uh, not surprising. And aside, did anybody watch the House MD series? It was popular some years ago. It's some mad Q Laurie is this uh, the actor with this mad diagnostician, the doctor trying to, you know, diagnose these weird patients that nobody knew how to diagnose. And the character's thing was that he would never talk to the patients or you know look at them or talk to them or anything because he wouldn't trust anything they said they did or whatever. Uh, but instead, he would look for other clues and whatnot, try to figure out what was wrong with them. Right, so this is an extreme case of you know people lie, right? You can't trust anything people tell you. You have to look at more objective measures right, that are not collected from the people themselves. Um, you know, or uh, in, could very well be that people tell you the truth and it's really what happened, but you don't have the ability to measure that construct accurately. Maybe you don't have quite the right data. Maybe your measurement is you know, invalid in some ways. Maybe your sample's not large enough to detect these differences between groups. A million reasons why you know, the thing may not show up in your quantitative analysis, even if it's genuinely there. Um, and, and anything else still, like both could be wrong. So, but it's important to realize kind of what some of these limitations are and try to look for the reasons behind these disagreements. It's often the most interesting part of a mixed method study is looking at these disagreements. Uh, by the way, speaking of interesting, this uh, phrase uh, caught my eye as I was reading. Uh, these tests resulted in several interesting and unexpected results, perhaps the most interesting, blah, blah, blah. Notice how, you know, they're holding the reader's hands, walking the reader through their results. Okay, they're guiding the reader towards what the authors thought were you know, the most interesting parts of their study. Right? And very simple, a small thing to do, but you know, very useful, very pleasant for a reader. Right? Like you're you know, being focused to look at, being guided to look at something that is maybe the most important part. So, OK, uh, end of the site, do you more? Um, I think there was there was a discussion after that that uh, sort of thought about areas in which this work could probably apply. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they sort of talked about like decision accuracy, um, like <laughs> it got kind of into like a what's the word, like the epistemological mm -hmm. <laughs> question, like, um, is it rational if, like, to impulsively buy because you'll be happier if you do that, um, rather than pre-planning all of your decisions. Um, and they also talked, like, of course, this is hugely important <laughs> with marketing execs, because if they can take the focus off of people feeling ashamed of their behavior as much as possible and make impulsive buying look like a good thing, then they'll get more sales. Yeah. Has anybody bought uh, anything impulsively lately? What are some examples? <laughs> the cat? Uh, no, that wasn't impulsive. That was like a 10 year decision. But I bought some uh, stickers in the plant, but I've been using the plant, so. <laughs> what did you buy? Skincare products for the cold. Skincare products, yeah. Impossibly. It makes sense, but. Any other fun angles? Um, a uh, 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 Nerf gun kit um, I found in, at, the, uh, at the Goodwill, yeah. but. Uh, but it turned out to be a good a Christmas present for someone. Yeah. So uh, 
That was fun. Um, my uh, wife doesn't let me go grocery shopping uh, as much. Uh, she likes to plan our groceries and whatnot, uh, write down what we need and sticks to the list. Uh, and whenever I go grocery shopping, you know, I always get distracted and, and both buy, you know, whatever is, you know, interesting on the shelf that day. So I always end up buying, you know, unnecessary groceries. Yeah, I don't have this problem anymore, but um, I used to go to the grocery store and walk out with like um, like three things of like strawberry, strawberry and Nesquik mix and mm -hmm. like like a lot of candy, like no real groceries. I guess the lesson from today is we shouldn't feel bad about it. Yeah, I should I should go back to doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but you shouldn't feel bad. Um, yeah, it's a rational thing to do. Yeah. I actually think uh, I use impulsive buying as a strategy when it comes to, like, if you go abroad and you want to get some trinkets, you know, you want to bring something home. I don't really know what I want to get, but when you see it in the moment, you're like, this is what I want. So I don't know. It's kind of in my mind, you know, I'll go through shops and I'll see something, you know, way too expensive. And then I was in France this summer and I saw like, a frog with a raincoat. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> so. I really resonated with the hypothesis that was about like perceptions of decision effort modify the individual impulse buying mm -hmm. trait. I think um, it takes me more effort than average to make decisions. Uh, and so I use impulse buying to buy mostly everything, at least at the product level. Like I might know that I want toilet paper, but I'm, I don't care what brand it is. Like if I look too hard, I will start thinking about it and that's bad. I guess it's why ads work that we sort of react to the ads and we don't you know, think about the comparing products or whatnot too much. Okay, so hopefully an interesting read, um, but you know, we'll come back, we'll see what some of these stats mean. We'll do them ourselves. We'll see other stats. The point is really not to look at the fine print here but to look at how the study was put together and what the components are, how they fit together to tell a story. That's what I'm hoping you get out of this. The individual results and the low-level uh, you know, analysis and conclusions, I don't care too much about for this purpose. But so how the parts fit together to tell a story is what I would like you to you know, take away from this. Okay? All right, let's do the other one uh, about online personas, social media. This was, I thought it was really well written. I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, another aside, the best written papers are, I think, to, to me, the ones with the simplest language. They're not the ones that use complicated words or constructions or anything. And, you know, we always try to sound smart when we write, I think, many of us. But that's, I think, the best, the better papers are the ones where we're not trying too hard to do that. that just, like are very readable. Right. Please, please tell us about this. Yeah, and I can use the whiteboard if that makes it easier. Please, absolutely. Yeah, we could do that. Um, we have some markers here, if you'd like. Yeah, hopefully they work. And several whiteboards you can choose from. Okay, this work. Um, yeah. Okay. So this was, uh, this was a study on. Um, basically, they're like, I mean, it's, it seems sort of straightforward in this sort of age of people using social media all the time. So I guess maybe the results are not as exciting as they once were. Um, but basically, they're looking at, uh, you know, okay, how how does how does the way that people you know fill out their Facebook profiles correlate uh, with like the number of friends they have? Is like the like the question they're asking. And, mm -hmm. um, okay, so specifically, so the the, the central research question is uh, is how do is how how do elements in a profile uh, influence the outcomes of using an online social network. So they're 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 asking if there's an implication from like which way for okay, this one. Uh, they're asking uh, if, if elements in a profile let's see, uh, and like the like the degree of completion and various characteristics of them and like which ones you filled out and you know, like whatever else. Uh, if that if that implies that you know a uh, greater number of friends. And they have a they have a couple secondary research questions after this, but um, I guess first I'll go over. Um, let's see, first I'll go over sort of the, the so they have three sort of core theoretical elements that are at play here. So the first is like signaling theory, which is like 
uh, signaling theory is like um, it's like it's like how people communicate with each other. It's uh, it's sort of like it's uh, it's it's like like so signaling signaling theory is like when you meet someone. It's like it's like how you how you communicate information to them. It's like how how you tell them like ask them like how you tell them about like relevant things mostly about yourself, right? And specifically with signaling theory, there's like there's like two main sort of deals. So, uh, so, so there's so there's one which is assessment signals, and there's uh, two which is I don't know what they call them, but they're like you know subjective things that are more about your like interests and stuff. They call them conventional signals. Mm -hmm. um, so. So, so signaling is a is a is, is sort of this you know framework of like how you understand uh like trans the trans the transmission of information between people, um, and the assessment signal is like you know like okay specifically specifically the example they give is like um, okay if you see someone who has like huge muscles right that indicates that they go to the gym a lot right um, that's like an assessment signal that 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 is like hard to fake I mean I guess you can fake it probably um, there's like a SpongeBob episode, okay. <laughs> but uh, so a, a conventional signal in that same sort of you know area would be like okay, well, like you go to the gym and you buy like one of their T-shirts, or you get like a like a T-shirt that says Gold Gym on it somewhere, right? And that is that's that's like easy to fake. I mean, so certainly it says something about you know like maybe maybe you're into fitness and you like um you're you like you like exercising or whatever else, but it's not as it's 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 something that's much less easily verifiable, right? It's like it's it's like this is like something that people can look at and just say, okay, like that's something I know about that person now versus like, this is something that this, that, that, that you're sort of trying to convey to the world. There's, there's, there's a, well, uh, not as much of an element of actuality there. Um, yeah, okay, so, so that's signaling. Uh, and then there's like common ground theory. Which is, this is, uh, you can say this is based on Rice's conversational maxims. Um, this sort of annoyed me. Um, uh, there's more to it than what they say in the paper, and this uh, seems like a kind of vacuous comparison. Uh, I mean, it, I think most most people who have some kind of linguistics training would be annoyed by it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, they say they say it's based on like Rice's conversational maxim, which basically states that like when like the point of of, of, of the reason why people have conversations with each other, right, is is to is to um, is to is to reach like a like a like a shared state of like is, is to reach into some 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 shared goal, right? Like the reason you have conversations with each other, like usually, is not just like is not just like idly. It's not because you're just passing the time. Like sometimes it's because of that, but most of the time it's because you're 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 both trying to reach some state of like of like knowing something or achieving some goal or, or like doing something, right? Um, yeah, and and that and that sort of comes up, that sort of comes up in that's, that's sort of especially relevant with with uh, uh, with, with social media because um, it's it's so one of one of one of the things that's that's sort of difficult to to to, to figure out is um, is if people are like lying, right? Um, so it's it's like it's so so one of, so problem one is like uh, how do you how do you know if if when you're looking at someone's profile online, if if, if this is something, if, if this is someone you you want to find common ground with, or or if you have some common ground with them, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, so one is you know finding shared goals. And two is like, um, which I guess is well, I won't I won't mention two, which is like the like the line bit, but since that's sort of relevant to all three of these theories, but. You know, this is this is really the main one where it's it's about like um, should you need one? Yeah, uh, like really, this is about like okay, so I I want I want to identify people like in this like community online uh, that 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 I can like find something in common with and like achieve some goal with or something like that, right? So it's about it's about like advancing like your like like causes that are common to both of you. Um, yeah, okay, and then and then the final sort of theory that they're going off of I forget the name it's uh it's transaction cost theory so um yeah 
Yeah, so this is uh, this is like a, this is something that's sort of drawn from economics. Uh, so in economics, uh, the paper says that the, that you use it to to talk about you know like like inefficiencies in the markets, right? Like okay, like you uh, like like you like you lose like you lose something in like in like searching for searching searching like the like searching for for the right thing to acquire or the, or the right or the right thing to buy, or or um, you know in uh, what are the what are the other examples they give? Like basically. Uh, it, it addresses like why markets fail, right? It's it's like I mean I'm not an economist, um, but like they're like all the externalities that are associated with like uh, uh, like things between like uh, people identifying a need and then fulfilling it in your market is like a lot of things, right? So like finding out that your product exists is one of those things. Um, here they 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 apply it in like a social context, so this is like. So so that so that so the deal here is like you're they're saying okay well maybe maybe filling out your profile more fully is like uh, like lowers the lowers the the the, the social cost of, of like finding your thing right so in that sense it's, it's somewhat related to the to the previous goal so uh, this is relevant again to to sort of rephrase because uh, your because you're making it easier for people to for, for other people to find you, you're you're making the market on Facebook, if you want to call it that, more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so you're making discoverability better. Pause for a minute. So this is okay. So there's a lot of important stuff going on here. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Um, one. What's the study setting again in the in a current paper? What do they study? Social media, Facebook, whatever, in 2006 or seven. Paper was 2007. Okay. They use three, not one, but three theories to guide their study, to form hypotheses and whatnot, to explain why people on Facebook might be uh, acting the way they are, might be populating their profiles the way they, they are. These three theories, was any of them developed for Facebook or on Facebook or about Facebook? No. In fact, they've, they've been around for a very long time. I don't know about the other two. Signaling theory has been around since like the 60s, probably. Paper does talk about like uh talk about how like some other people like Donut and Ford talk about how signal theory has some impact on social media. Yes. Okay. But so what's going on here fundamentally is that who who's on Facebook? At least back then, it was people, not bots just yet. Okay. Okay. And you know, if you think about it, people, it's not the first time we see people ever on Facebook. In fact, people have been around for a long time, turns out, and have been studied for a long time. And we know lots of things about people and how they interact and how they think and how they do things and whatnot. Okay? And we know lots of things from different fields. We know about them from economics. We know about them from psychology. We know about them from all kinds of angles. So if you really think about it, you know, the people on Facebook are not that special. They're ultimately people after all. So probably, you know, of course, of course, the medium, the platform shapes what's going on. But the people are people and they probably act in people ways, you know, in the different situations you put them in. Okay? So, like, you know, there's a lot of work in software engineering about programmers, how people communicate and collaborate and learn and all kinds of things. Um, and all of this is also very often informed by all of these decades of research in other fields about people and cognition and communication and whatever else. So that note how you know to describe and understand and characterize and explain what is going on on this new platform at the time, this new platform, they relied on lots of things that we knew about how people act and present themselves and do whatever since forever. So this is, you know, interesting. Um, it's also interesting that I pieced together, you know, these different components that maybe capture different aspects of 
people's behavior and whatnot. All right, so you know, you might be asking, I, I, I get this question sometimes, how do you come up with these theories? Where do you get them? I said, you know, this is cool. Now, when you see it in retrospect, it looks like a nicely told story. But then how do you come up with these? Where do you find them? Any thoughts? Like what if there were, you know, three others they didn't talk about? Or... Mm -hmm. Basically. I mean, really, it's that's the bad news. It's just by reading. By reading and, I don't know, learning and talking to people and so on. There's no, maybe chat GPT, maybe. We're trying. We should try it. My, you know, maybe an LLM that has read a lot can do this these days, I don't know. But really, it's by reading a lot. Uh, and what I'd like you to, uh, what I'd like to encourage you to do as part of this class is to appreciate reading outside of the inevitably narrow areas you do research in. You know, all of us do research in an inevitably narrow area because we specialize in whatever we end up doing. Uh, but there's a whole world of science out there and it's often very fascinating and interesting. And hopefully I, you know, get to get you to appreciate more of it like this. All right. Yeah, uh, so is there any chance of pulling this up? If not, I can just use this for I think so. I think there is a chance. Yeah, so those, those are like the core like theories that are at play there. They're, they also mentioned this other one called like Wolfer's social information processing theory, um, which is not really like something they use in their study, but it's, it's, it's more just something used to explain like, okay, like, I, I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned with uh, a, a sort of through line of all of these things is that you have to deal with like, um, like they're all dealing with like the transmission of information in some in some in some respect, right? And the kind of uh, one of one of the core like limitations, or I mean, one of the core things that you have to deal with, uh, and, and maybe a limitation of this thing is that people are going to be dishonest, right? And then they do sort of they, they they do sort of address this a little bit with the you know like the assessment versus the conventional things, and I'll talk about that in a in a bit. But uh, basically, they, they they mention this this interesting thing called you know that. Walter's uh, social information processing theory, which basically says that, you know, in the absence of like social cues that tell you uh, whether people are lying online, you, you you fall back to other things like, you know, are they like, like, are they spelling words correctly? Um, you know, so you can figure out whether they're telling, whether they're telling the truth, um, whether that's a good or a bad thing. I, you know, I guess I don't really know, um, but that's, that's their claim. Um, okay. So, uh, from this, this they, they sort of split this research question into two separate ones. Okay, I'll use a different different more colors. Um, so, so the, the the first research question is, um, you know, what are the relationships between the various types of profile fields uh, and the number of friends a user has on their on their social network uh, site on on Facebook? So, uh, by various types of profile fields, they basically mean like okay, like I mean, it's it's related to it's it's related mostly to this stuff, um, but also also the other ones. Um, they're they're mostly looking at in the end they're going to be mostly looking at you know like which 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 ones are correlated with assessment and which ones are correlated are, are correlated with with um with you know like less less like objective factors like less verifiable factors. And unsurprisingly, it turns out that these are a lot more important than these. Spoiler. Um, uh, but they also connect. They, they they also use this to explain like you know why why these are important in the first place. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm getting ahead of myself a bit here, so, uh, you know, um, so they're looking at the relationship between types of profile fields, uh, uh, you say something about the, um, dependent variable here, number of friends, why do they, what are they trying to capture there? Uh, yeah, so, uh, oh, I guess I was going to get, oh, yeah. Um, so by number of friends, oh, do you mean like specifically how they measure it or? No, but like wh why measure that in the first place? What are they trying to get at? Oh, sure. It, uh, I think I think they're mostly trying to measure like, um, like to what extent. So I guess it's, I think they're trying to get at like this, this sort of underlying notion of like, um, like trust maybe is, is was maybe my, my reading of it. Like, 
like to what extent is like do people consider these things like important? It's 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 sort of I mean you could view the study as, as as more of as a maybe maybe more generally, although I don't think they would they don't they don't claim this explicitly, but you could maybe generalize some of the things there they 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 reach in the study as a general uh, maybe, maybe building towards a, a generalized theory of like how you interact online, right? So it's like um, all this is sort of feeding into like you know what what's like clearly online communication is like markedly different from how people interact in person, uh, and, and this is informed by this stuff. Um, they're they're sort of beginning to get at like uh, what sorts of information people consider to be important online. Um, that you that you know that that are not are not necessarily related to the things that you would consider to be important in person. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's like an accurate. Can I pause for another minute? Yeah. So there's another really deep thing going on here. Okay. So you you know you might ask who cares about Facebook? I was like why 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 do this in the first place? Do you have any thoughts on like why this study at all? Like. Huh? Sure. Well, Facebook was really new back then. It was, and, and social networks were new back then. It was a new phenomenon. Okay, so I, I, I stand corrected. I take it back. You're right. So, you know, often new things are very interesting just intrinsically because they're new and we need to understand this kind of what's going on. Uh, but, you know, there's a million of these uh, platforms coming out all the time. There's the next thing after that. There's Twitter, there's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's whatever else. There's tons of these. There have been lots of tags in the meantime. Does that mean that we have to do this for every single one of them every time? Um, no, but unless I think you, you want to study too much if it has some new feature that has um, affects how people interact with it some way that's different from the previous ones. Mm -hmm. But so this is a really deep thing that's happening here that I want you to make sure you notice as we're like discussing this. Like, you just talked about this. So we're, you know, we're studying Facebook now because it's maybe new and popular and interesting. But we're not really studying Facebook. Facebook happens to be a maybe interesting because it's new, maybe convenient because we had access to the, the data somehow, study setting. Oh, we're not really studying Facebook, you know, just like this class isn't really about whatever it's really about. It's about these other things that it's really about. Okay. So, you know, we're studying Facebook as we can ultimately, but we really care about studying this kind of online interaction, which is likely to be fundamentally different from person, you know, real life interaction, person to person real life interaction. Um, and for lucky, we're going to learn things from Facebook that then carry over to TikTok, to Instagram, to Twitter, to whatever else, to all these other platforms and websites and whatnot that have these fundamental characteristics, like, I don't know, profile pages for users or something like that. GitHub, if you will, as profile pages for users. Right, so we happen to study Facebook, but we learn a lot of more generalizable things about how people present themselves and interact online that then carry over to say GitHub or something else. Okay, how you guarantee that uh, that will change? Okay, okay, good, good question. Did you talk about this? I mean, it's not. I think I think the point is less that you can guarantee that it'll generalize, and more that it's very very difficult to work on it to work towards directly on the generalized theory of like. Like like it's very difficult. Like it's much easier to 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 do it on on this like Facebook thing, and then and then and then do it on like something else, and then and then sort of like like do like the join of those two things, rather than like say okay, I'm going to make like like the most like generic like social networky thing that like is like the intersection of like every other social networking site's features, or maybe the union of them, um, and like and like do my study on that thing, right? Because then you have to get everyone to use it, and you have to make sure that you're recruiting people to use your thing in the right way. And, like it's I agree with all that, but another minute if, if you can afford us one. Yeah, we have a couple. Um, so th this is a really good point. Maybe, maybe the number one point to take home from today, certainly one of the top three points to take home from today, is about generalized validity. Um, I claim that there are only two mechanisms to generalize results 
uh, beyond the sample that you study in any given study. Only two mechanisms to generalize beyond your current sample. What are they? Did we talk about this last week? No. I have like deja vu because I sometimes go back and look at last year's lectures, the recordings to remind myself what we talked about. We talked about this last year. I can guess. I guess. Sure. Maybe one is trying to show that your uh, the problem that everyone thought was new is just an example of one that's already been solved before. And another one is that sort of joining thing. I like the first one. But I want, let me hear more ideas. What What do you think? How do we generalize anything? What mechanisms make sure that the sample is representative of information? That's good too. What does that mean? That's different, but, but good too. Yeah. That you have uh, people from all possible groups. On the population. The word I'm looking for is statistically, I think. Right? So you, you have some sample that you studied. It's always a sample because you can't study everyone or everything. It's always a sample. And you somehow are confident that your sample is statistically representative of the whole population. This is, by the way, what pollsters do. Uh, today, today, the New Hampshire yeah. primary. So, you know, election year, lots of these uh, going around this year. It's what pollsters do to, you know, uh, report which candidate is more likely to win the election, right? They never ask, you know, 300 million or 200 million people in the US that vote, right? They always, you know, sample a few hundred and ask them. And you know it's very complicated how they do that. They have a very complicated ways to decide who they ask and, and not ask. But they always ask a few hundred people, and then they tell you often with high confidence, meaning you know with small margin of error. Right? They tell you that candidate X is likely to win, you know, this percentage of votes plus or minus a, a little bit. Right. So this is mechanism one: it's statistical generalization from a sample. Right? So you, you always have a sample and you I don't know, have a, a way of estimating how representative it is of the, of the overall population. Most easily, the, if the sample is random, very easy to estimate how representative it is of the overall population. That's what typically you see in research studies, people drawing random samples of something. Right? There's, I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, 200 million repositories on GitHub and I study open source repositories. Uh, I'm not gonna you know, uh, mine data from 200 million of them because it will take forever. I'm gonna draw a random sample of some, I don't know, thousand of them and I'm gonna do my analysis of that. Okay, and I can be confident because I drew their sample randomly that you know, whatever I find on, on this random sample is within some margin of error, the same on the other ones that I didn't look at. Mechanism one is sampling. Okay. Mechanism two is something that we're talking about today and something that Kaya mentioned. And it's why we talk about theory. Mechanism two is called analytical generalization. Right? The first one is statistical. The second one is analytical. Analytical is basically all of this, it's basically just theory. Because okay. Facebook, you know, is not really that interesting. Okay. It's people uh, signaling online. That's really what's happening, right? You know, what you see in their profile pages is a reflection of these underlying qualities that they're trying to signal. Uh, and you know, which of those elements in a profile page you can trust more or less, right? You know, sort of guided by by this theory. And then when you see them on Twitter and Facebook and, and TikTok and whatever else, it's probably going to be the same. But, you know, if it's not, it might be worth studying. If you have some reason to suspect that it may be different, 
maybe there's, you know, long mentioned this, maybe there's some interesting new feature of TikTok that, you know, Facebook didn't have, and you suspect you have some good reason to suspect that it might change this behavior. Maybe it's worth studying again on Twitter, sorry, on, on TikTok when, when that happens. But otherwise, you know, you've, you've seen it once on Facebook, and then next time you see it on Twitter, next time you see it on, I don't know what else, you can expect it will be the same. Because really, you're not seeing Facebook, you're seeing this underlying much more fundamental thing, that Facebook happened to be an instance of. Okay? You're seeing the theory, not the instance. Okay, which is why we're talking about theory today, which is why theory is so cool when it comes to empirical research. Because it allows you this amazing thing, which you can almost not get any other way, right? It allows you to generalize beyond the sample you are studying, which is always a great thing to have. Uh, so do you think part of this is maybe an attempt to understand like humans offline as well? Like it's just that social networks give you like this framework where you have like easily measurable metrics. Like it's hard to measure signaling online, but it's easier online. Yeah, so definitely. So um, our colleague in S3D, Patrick Park, you know, he's a um, computational social scientist slash social networks person or network science person. Um, he studies um, wormholes in social net human networks, social networks. Um, so you know, imagine uh, know, your friends of 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 your friends and so on, right? You have these super long chains. So you expect that the farther you are from you, the less relevant those connections become. Okay. Very hard to study this in the physical world, um, but with something like Twitter and whatnot, the social media, you now have uh, large scale data sets you know, to study this otherwise fundamentally human you know, property or, or phenomenon. So then he's been doing that kind of work and finding all kinds of super interesting things about how the utility of these extremely distant connections actually is very high, surprisingly. But it, it does go down the farther you are in the beginning, but then it goes up again and becomes extremely useful again. So it's something amazing, mind blowing, that you could not have found arguably without these you know, online data sets. So I think absolutely you could do that. All right, so theory school, please. Okay, uh, yeah, so I think we're, we're done at 450, right? 450, okay. yeah, okay. okay. Um, I will try to wrap this up quickly. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, so just to, just to reiterate, uh, research question one is, okay, like which, which like types of like information were provided by default if you just like, if you just look at someone who's like got a Facebook profile and they have to see Facebook. Um, and how does that correlate to the, to the number of friends they have? Um, and, uh, so the research question too is like, okay, like, is there any variation in like, um, well, I guess actually not. I crossed the wires in my head. I just said this one, um, and 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 this one is the is the one I explained before. Um, okay, so okay. on. Okay, so we can go to the methods now. Um, the the way they did this is, um, I actually I actually looked over their 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 talk for this and they. Um, I think they actually got in some trouble with Facebook for the for the way they collected their data, because um, they 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 crawled the so back when they did this, uh, Facebook was like university only. I think so. When you signed up for Facebook, you had to like say, okay, I'm part of so and so university, and they did this at Michigan State. So they they crawled the like um, thirty thousand seven hundred seventy three like people uh, or like users on the Michigan State University Facebook like group. Um, I don't know if there were public groups back then. I, I, I still don't know how Facebook works, so I might be using incorrect terminology for most things. Um, uh, so they, they, they crawled the MSU Facebook, they found... Yes, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. Sort of something like that. Uh, I think the red one works. Um, oh. uh, they found um, like 30K users uh, 
And one of the issues here is that I think approximately like 19% of the people of the users on the MSU like Facebook network were like set to private. So they have this like rel relatively large contingency of people who um who they, who they can collect it on. Um and they and they mentioned this as a limitation of their paper because it's I mean it stands to reason that if that like if you're if you're like technically like literate enough to like um know how to change the privacy settings on your Facebook profile, uh you might have like statistically significant differences in like your Facebook usage and like your friend networks and um like how you build your profile information and how that and how then how that profile information correlates to the number to the number of friends you have and you know whatever else. Um so that's like relevant detail. Uh yeah. Another issue is uh the Facebook interface like changed, I think, over like the 12 days that they collected this data. Um so it's that's a, like um uh, instability in like the and like the way that they that they were able to scrape this is also was also a big factor. Um uh, so independent variables were um whether the profile field was filled out at all. Um and if so, how much? Um and they also had a bunch of coding variables for for doing like a multivariate analysis. So they, they have their analysis in like two sections. The first is like, okay, we're gonna go over like each type of like information we have and and like the like just like the literal correlation between like that piece of information being filled out, for example, like you know, assessment uh, assessment information relating to like where you grew up or whatever, um, and like the number of friends you have. Um, they also had a multivariate analysis that sort of tried to determine, um, like, okay, like out of like out of out of each of these, uh, out of each of each of the like uh, things we varied, like uh, which of them were more were, were like most important when you like take them all together. Um, that's accurate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Independent variables. Uh, also, I guess I'll skip those a Yes. More, more a high level point of the analysis. You know, they collected some data. Yeah. Did the statistics. Yeah. Hopefully, in a in a careful way. Yeah. To you know test numerically for these correlations, and they found something, and then discussed the results. Yeah. I'm happy with sort of that level of, of detail for the uh, remainder. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, dependent variables were like friends were so they, they, they flip this into because of the structure of Facebook and the find this place, they flip the respondent into the uh, friends at MSU versus friends at like not MSU. Uh, yeah. And that her, I guess, I guess the mean for friends at MSU was 95 across all users. It was higher for undergraduates, less for grad students. So there's actually like an interesting like tale of like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're like a, if you're like an undergrad, you're like here. Uh, if you're like, if, like as you, as you move up in the academic chain, it turns out that you have less Facebook friends. Um, well, whether that correlates to real life friends is, uh, I guess I, <laughs> I guess I guess since I stopped becoming undergrad, I have less. Is that true? No, I don't. Well, um, but at, at that time, it was, it was most Facebook demographic shift was very drastic. But back then, it was mostly like undergraduate person and young people, and then now it's like all old people. Well, not all, but like stereotypically old people. Yeah, and so so you're, you're saying you're saying these people got old and they shifted to the right. <laughs> uh, right. And it, you know, they, it was cool back then, so the young people were getting on Facebook. Yes. Um, okay. So that's so this this I, I think the I think the, the, the independent variables analysis was. I mean, it's it's sort of typical for this, but it's maybe not the interesting part. Uh, or it's not, it's not as interesting as the multivariate analysis, I think. So they had a bunch of coding variables. Um, and by this, I just mean like, um, like uh, just just things that like like things that they considered the, considered in the multivariate analysis, like like what what you controlled, um, like and, and various like input factors to the like what affects your number of friends. Um, so this is a good point for another pause. Sorry to interrupt you, but but sort of relevant, I think, meta point. Um, is this so? You know, they did statistics, some correlations. Um, to test for you know associations between these variables, is this a causal relationship or not? You know, right. does yeah. have room room. I don't think you can necessarily just claim that it's causal because they don't know about the context of the people. Like they could be a leader in some undergrad organization, so they're naturally going to have more mm -hmm. like just social connections. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So. Um, actually, feel they're very clear and careful about scoping their claims. They explicitly say, we've shown here a non-causal link between blah, 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 blah. 
you know, because the methods they were using, these um, statistical associations between variables, just fundamentally cannot allow you to draw the, that sort of causal uh, claim about something. Okay. Um, where was I going with this? Ah, yes, okay, yes. So the other thing, uh, which we won't talk about today, uh, but we'll talk about more when we do these kind of, kind of analyses ourselves, even though they did not claim causal links, they did try in their analysis, they did the multivariate analysis, and they tried to account for other things that could explain these differences, other than the, I don't know, presence or whatever of these profile elements which is why this was a multivariate analysis in the first place. So they sort of, you know, they didn't claim a causal link because they can't, but they did try something, you know, more than the absolute minimum here, right? They tried to isolate the effects of, you know, some of these variables from the effects of others that may vary at the same time. Okay. So still, you know, good, good attempt at going in the right direction. So, you know, the simplest thing you could do is some bivariate correlation between two things. You know, does X vary with Y, right? Then you do two at a time, All right? So the Y here is number of Facebook friends. You know, does, I don't know, having a profile picture vary with the number of friends? Does whatever else they have, you know, lots of things extracted from the profile pages, you know, does that vary with the number of friends? You could do this, you know, one at a time with the number of friends, okay? But that doesn't tell you very much because you know having a profile picture could itself vary with something else in your profile, like the location or something other than that. Okay, so it doesn't isolate the effect of one from the effects of all the other ones that may also vary at the same time. But we're going to talk a lot more about these kinds of things uh, later on. I want to be mindful of time, so may maybe we'll actually pause here with yeah. this paper. I think we got most of most of this. There's one meta point I want to um, make. In the last minute or so, um, we're talking about theory. We're going to continue talking about theory on Thursday. I will have a little more to tell you. Uh, but one minute point for today is you know, a, lot, a lot of you have told me last week that uh, for your actual research at the moment, you're building tools that do something or you know, algorithms or something. You're building a new thing that does something, uh, and you need to evaluate it in some convincing way. So the meta point to end today's class, another take home message is when you do that, when you do that evaluation, you should test the underlying theory that your tool embodies, not the tool itself. You should design your evaluation in such a way that tests the underlying theory behind your tool, not the tool itself. You know, let's say you're building, uh, I don't know, an AI assistant that writes code for you automatically. Trendy these days. Okay. Design your experiments and whatnot, your study, your empirical study to evaluate this tool in a way that teaches you something more generalizable about how people program, how they learn, how they learn new APIs, you know, whatever it may be, but something more generalizable, test some underlying theory about how people program. And you just happen to test it through your tool for the same reasons we talked about earlier with this you know, Facebook study. So that when the next you know, AI assistant comes out next month and the next one after that a month later and so on and so forth, we can still expect these fundamental insights to be there and to hold. Even if the you know UI changes slightly or whatever else, the model is slightly more performant or whatever it may be, because it was never about that. It was about how people you know learn to program or write code or whatever, read code, you know whatever it may be in the first place. It was really about that, not about the tool itself. The tool. So as you're thinking about this in your own work, the tool doesn't matter. The tool is just a vehicle for you to test this underlying theory that you really deeply care about. That sort of value will be. And you're doing that through your tool. And obviously, the tool will be successful and popular, but it's not about the tool. It's about these more fundamental insights. Good, po uh, good point to pause. Um, so, we're going to pick up leftovers about theory and we'll do other things about the interview and whatnot. I guess we'll do the Raymarkers paper and the Bogart paper.
much more briefly on Thursday. So we're gonna, I guess so with that in mind, so two prompts for Thursday about the two papers. Uh, one minute only summary of what the study was about, what, what did they do, uh, and uh, how, if at all, do they use theory in those studies? Or you know, what can we learn that's more generalizable than they, the study itself reported? Okay. So um, that's it for now. I will post a homework assignment for you to do a lit review and write down a one page or something uh, later of this week, and that will be due next week at some point. Okay. Um, always ask me when I say something that doesn't make sense, you know, like today with the papers that were confusing, just ask me. I see a lot of you on, you know, the hallway, ask me. I don't buy that promise. Okay, thank you so much for presenting today. Great job, and I'll see you all on Thursday.